Welcome to Dune, chapter by chapter. I'm Dominic. So in the last chapter, it was a battle of wits almost, or a dueling of minds between Baron Harkonnen and Thufir Hawat. And in that chapter, uh, they were trying to like figure each other out, and but also use one another to each other's advantage, where the Baron still wanted to use Thufir Hawat for his own end gains, and uh, but also knowing that Thufir Hawat is scheming to somehow undermine House Harkonnen and destroy the Baron. And uh, in that last chapter, it became known that uh, Thufir Hawat starting to suspect that some of the Atreides that were reported dead may actually be alive because the, the Fremen were destroying uh, the troops of Raban. And Raban was covering this up in his reports to his uncle. But what uh, Thufir Hawat was able to observe is that a lot of the techniques and uh, tactics used by the Fremen were Atreides in nature. So he suspected maybe Duncan Idaho didn't die and he's actually leading these Fremen attacks against the Harkonnen. Uh, but who's really doing it is, of course, uh, Paul Atreides, Muad'Dib. But nobody knows Muad'Dib at this point is Paul Atreides. So now in this chapter, we're back on Arrakis and back with Paul. And it starts off with the, with the kind of interesting thing. Paul is almost like in another trance-like state due to his uh, meal that he just had that's full of spice. And he's like in this trance. And he's seeing all these different images. And what's interesting is as he's observing them, he doesn't really know. He's almost like he's starting to break from reality too much uh, because he's he has like memories of uh, him and Chani's son, Lido II, and Chani being in the deep south. But then he's almost confused. Well, is that a future event or is that something that's happening now? And so things like that are going on in his mind. And so he's in this weird trance-like state. And uh, so... What finally breaks him out of it is there is a fight in the outside, outside his room in the corridor. So he goes out to see what's happening, what's what's going on, and uh, all these people are carrying away a dead body, and it is uh, actually Chani who has killed a challenger, uh, another Fremen that have that have come to challenge Paul in combat. I guess for leadership and things like that. Uh, but uh, Chani has killed him. And now Paul's a little bit upset by this because he tells Chani, well, you don't have to protect me. Uh, you know, I can handle these challengers on my own. Uh, I don't need my wife to, to uh, you know, shield me. And then uh, Chani then tells him, well, it's easier for me or your other wife, Hera, to uh, challenge these uh, guys and kill them off uh, than have you be distracted constantly by having to answer these challenges where you can just focus on your leadership role and uh, guiding the Fremen in their fight against the Harkonnen. And uh, her logic behind this is pretty sound because she tells them that if they come and they're defeated by a woman, your wife, they'll suffer a humiliating defeat and death. And uh, so no one will want to take that chance and the challenges will lessen. And which Paul then realizes he can't really argue with that logic because sees for himself that the uh, the, the challenges have uh, have dropped off quite a bit. Uh, there hasn't been any as many people coming to challenge him for his leadership and things like that. So then he finally sees the truth of uh, uh, Chani's uh, words. But what's interesting is this uh, illustrates just how deadly the Fremen are becoming because the reason why Chani... Uh, can dispatch all these guys that come to challenge Paul is because now she's been trained in the weirding way. And uh, so that's what uh, was kind of discussed in the last chapter with uh, Thufir Hawat and the Baron as uh, why one of the reasons why the Emperor wanted uh, House Atreides destroyed was that he realized that uh, Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck were able to train the Atreides men almost to the point where they were almost as deadly as the Sadukar. Uh, so there was an actual competing force, potentially a competing force against the Sadukar. So then the other thing they realized that if this training was given to the Fremen, whose uh, conditions, environmental conditions, are way more harsh 
than the conditions on uh, Seleucia Secundus, the Emperor's uh, present planet, that if these people were trained to the same level that the Harkonnen, uh, that the Atreides men were, uh, you know, incorporated with, trained by Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck and then trained in the Weirding way, they would be a superior force to the Emperor. And there's millions of Fremen. Uh, so the Emperor kind of realizing this was one of the reasons why he wanted uh, House Atreides destroyed. And then why he teamed up with House Harkonnen and created this elaborate trap. Uh, so that's what this is illustrating now that, uh, this is how deadly that the Fremen are, that they, this is how deadly they've become now that there are more and more and more of them are being trained in the Weirding way. Uh, so that's a pretty cool, uh, thing that's happening in the story. Now, the other thing is we learn in this chapter that Paul becomes aware that Gurney Halleck is actually alive. Now, Gurney Halleck has been hiding out with the smugglers the whole time. And uh, now Paul has actually seen Gurney Halleck among a band of smugglers, but uh, he couldn't uh, make his presence known to Gurney because he didn't want to give anything away to any potential Harkonnen or Sadukar that could then follow him back to his siege and, uh, you know, endanger the rest of the Fremen. So he had to ignore it, but uh, he did see Gurney Halleck and he knows he's alive. And uh, what made him think of this is actually heard someone playing the bassinet, uh, another musician, and it was very, sounded very similar to the way Gurney Halleck used to play. And it caused him to like remember his friend. So he is aware that Gurney Halleck's alive. And so is Thufur Hawat. Uh, so what's what else happens in this chapter is now Paul confronts his uh, mother and uh, they have kind of an interesting conversation here because uh, Paul's mother is uh, really becoming concerned with how this religion is being new religion is being built up around her son as this uh, prophet figure, a messiah figure and all that. And uh, she's and what I kind of get from this chapter is as they're talking is Jessica might be aware of what what this could potentially mean in the future. So the same as Paul has these visions of, you know, this holy jihad that's going to burn its way across the universe, that if he goes down a certain path, that's what's going to be unleashed. And I think his mother uh, kind of, you know, has the same, is kind of aware of the same thing. Because she warns him by quoting an old Bene Gesserit proverb, when religion and politics travel in the same cart, the riders believe nothing can stand in their way. Their movement becomes headlong, faster and faster and faster. They put aside all thoughts of obstacles and forget that a precipice does not show itself to the man in a blind rush until it's too late. And then Paul just kind of shrugs her off, saying uh, the Fremen have a simple and practical religion. And uh, his mother again warns him, nothing is simple about religion. So like this proverb illustrates like how powerful this movement can become because they're like a political movement. They want to they want to terraform Arrakis. They have this shared dream that kind of bonds all the Fremen together, um, you know, to build, make Arrakis into a more livable planet and uh, couple that up with this new religion that's sprouting up around Muad'Dib, this uh, Messiah, the savior that's going to free them from uh, oppression of the Harkonnens and help them uh, bring this dream to life of changing the face of Arrakis and freeing the Fremen people. And uh, his mother can see that this is going to be, this could be a very dangerous thing. This is a very dangerous path they're on because once something like this gets rolling, it's very hard to stop. And uh, so that's the thing that is uh, interesting about this, that his mother can kind of see the same thing that Paul can see that uh, this jihad that if unleashed, it'll just keep going and going and going and will, will cost billions of lives. And then they also discuss Paul's sister, because now at this point in the story, Paul's sister is like, you know, a small child and um, everyone is kind of freaked out by Alia, <laughs> all the other women and stuff uh, that live in the same uh, siege as Jessica and her daughter, because as you recalled in the last one of the few chapters back when uh, Lady Jessica had to take the water of life, she was pregnant with Alia 
And this was something that was never done before. And it was something that, you know, the other Bene Gesserit had warned her about, or it was a thing that, you know, you could create what was known as an abomination. And uh, so Alia also went through the same transformation as Jessica. So Alia was suddenly snapped into awareness instantly as a fetus inside of her mother with all the memories of the past Bene Gesserit, same as her mother. Uh, so she was like opened up to all these all these past lives and all these past memories, like instantly. So it was extremely traumatic and terrifying for her. And now that she's a small child, she's a small child, but she's not really a small child. She doesn't have a mind of a small child uh, because she has all these, you know, lifetimes and lifetimes of experience and memories of all these past lives and personalities inside of her. So it freaks everyone else because she can talk like an adult and she can reason like an adult. Uh, even on a level that the, the adults can't because, you know, most people, we only have our certain set of memories of our own life. We can't, we can't know what it's like. There's no way you could know what it's like if you had the combined life memories of like hundreds of hundreds of even or even millions of people that have lived across uh, different periods of time and had very different life experiences and stuff and um, how that would affect you or what that would do to a person. So it, she's operating on a level that no one can really comprehend. The only one that can kind of comprehend it is Jessica, which she kind of tells Paul, you know, um, because, you know, Paul is kind of a little bit resentful of his mother because he doesn't really know that she is, has accepted Chani as his mate, that uh, now has given him a child, uh, Lido too. And, um, you know, and then at the same time, Jessica is kind of worried that Paul might look upon his younger sister as some sort of an abomination or a freak. But he reassures her he doesn't. And uh, But Jessica also points out that there's no way Paul can know what Alia is going through or even her because he's never experienced the other memory. Uh, so he reassures his mother, you know, I don't think anything's wrong with Alia. I don't think she's a freak and I accept her. And then Jessica does the same thing for Paul, assures him that she also uh, accepts Chani and cares about Chani as well. And uh, so... Um, then later on, now what? Now the, the the big event in this chapter is as the chapter progresses. Uh, the, the last half of the chapter is actually Paul preparing to summon a sandworm. Now this is something that all the Fremen are taught to do by the age of twelve. And Paul hasn't done it yet, and this is kind of like a uh, a rites of passage in the manhood for the Fremen that you can call and ride a worm. Uh, manhood or adulthood or whatever you want to say. Um, so but what's interesting is Paul has basically become like the new leader of the Fremen, but at the same time, he's, he's, he's kind of like the most simplest thing among the Fremen. He can't do it. And that's summoning a worm. So he realizes that for them, for him, that this, this is one more step he needs to take to fully cement himself as the new leader of the Fremen is do this call a sandworm and uh so they're, they're all there and he has to do it in broad daylight and uh all the other fremen uh, there's a bunch of fremen there watching him chani is there by his side and stilgar prepared the thump thumper that he has to use personally so there's a whole ritual to this and uh, it kind of describes uh the reason why they do it a certain way in uh, the book that I remember before I read Dune and I had seen uh, the 1984 Dune as a child, I never really understood what he was doing with the worm and how you, how that was supposed to, like, how he was trying to ride it and stuff until I read the book and then I went back and watched rewatched the movie. Then that made sense, that scene. So uh, what he has to, what you have to do is get up alongside of a worm as it surfaces out, uh, you know, being attracted to the thumper and then get the hook in the side of one of its gills and crack the gill open what that does is it exposes like the vulnerable flesh uh, to the coarse sand. So the sandworm will roll so it gets that point of its body that is um, exposed to the, it'll, from the, the furthest away from the sand. So it'll roll on that side so that becomes the top of the worm. And that way you can get up. And it won't go back down under the sand as long as that is exposed and open. And that's how the Fremen are able to ride the worms. Uh, and that's how they're able to steer them and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it is, uh, it's it's kind of a cool thing that, uh, that 
is described in the book and Frank Herbert obviously did a lot of research when he got into writing this and so this is just all these details is what makes the uh, the world that Frank Herbert created so interesting so then Paul does uh, use the thumper he does call a sandworm and then to his shock it is the largest sandworm he has ever seen and it's described in the book as being half a league long now, if you're wondering what, uh, how big or how, 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 what kind of a distance a league is or half a league, uh, I googled it. So it's, uh, so half a league would be 2,778 meters or 1.726 miles in length. So that is a huge creature <laughs> and it describes it as the mound of sand that it's pushing in front of it as it's coming up out is, it looks like a mountain coming towards Paul. And it's just like, this is where we get some actual, what I like about this chapter is you get some actual more detailed lengths of how big some of these sandworms can get. So this is like a humongous creature, just, uh, just giant sized to be that long. And, uh, so Paul sees that coming towards him. And what's kind of cool about this chapter that it ends on a cliffhanger because this is a, where the, where it ends. Paul sees this gigantic worm coming towards him and then the chapter ends. And then we go on to the next chapter. So it's a bit of a cliffhanger that you're left. Okay, what's going to happen um, with this gigantic worm that's headed towards Paul? So it creates a little bit of a uh, tension there. And and you want to know, move on to the next chapter and find out what's going on. So I thought that was kind of cool that the chapter ended like that. Uh, so this is another one of those chapters that's kind of like one of those pivotal ones. Uh, this event of Paul riding the sandworm. And this is something that's always been, well, at least the last two screen versions of Dune have had this scene in them. The 84 version has had it, and the miniseries has had it as well. The scene that shows Paul having to do this, having to ride the sandworm. And hopefully we get to see it a third time in the new version created by, or directed by Denis Villeneuve. And uh, now this is a scene I don't think will be in the first uh, movie because it's too far along in the book now. I think, knock on wood, they we get part two. Then in part two, we'll get to see this, but this time it'll be the Denis Villeneuve version of Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides, you know, having to ride the sandworm. And hopefully, I really hope we get to see it. So that's everything I got to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comments section, and I will see you at the next one.